All right. Looks like we're hot. Welcome to Trinity City. Everything you're going to see today is visualized using JavaFX. This is not a JavaFX presentation. But I want to make clear that if anybody has any questions related to either the explainable AI analysis or, hey, how the hell did you even do that using JavaFX, please ask. Shout it out, raise your hand, come down and ask. Oh, oh, I'm going to say some bad words then. Okay. There is no effing JavaScript. Did I get the Fs? Kind of. This kind of looks Flemish, actually. There's no JavaScript involved, all right? This is a desktop application. And there's a good reason why. But again, this is not going to be me pounding home JavaFX development. But I think you'll see the value as we go through this. But we're going to talk about the some use, uh, use case. And we're going to go into a deep dive. So to do that... Let's switch over to some slides. Uh, let's go full screen. Right. OK. So uh, not JavaFX, <laughs> PowerPoint. So uh, you, I keep saying this word Trinity. Uh, there's a picture of Trinity. I have not been sued yet by Warner Brothers. It's any day now. And I work for the John Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab in the state of Maryland of the United States of America. We are a nonprofit, federally funded, Research Institute. Fancy words. What does that mean? That means we don't, we're not here to sell you anything. We're not here to sell anybody anything. We're here to do the best good that we can do. And our customer is the US government. There's places around the world that do similar things for other governments. But what that means is we get presented with a huge host of problems. And these problems range from flying to the moon Titan of Saturn to brain-computer interfaces, to training AI, to countering AI. Think about the bad guys. So I was just talking to my new best friends here. Uh, we're going to swap spit afterwards in blood, you know, you know, be blood brothers. But the <laughs> this is, you see the look on this guy's face. It's terrible. <laughs> the, uh, there's a lot of bad guys out there, right? These two. Me, right? I think bad, right? which is why they put me on these projects, because there's a lot of other bad people out there. And they try to, you know, everybody, I've seen a lot of presentations so far that talk about large language models and generative AI, and everybody's really optimistic and excited. I'm happy for that. But uh, guess what? Uh, they're being used for precision targeted propaganda at a massive scale. And who are they targeting? And they've been doing it. And you don't even realize it. And I hear, I have friends, I have family, oh, I'd know the difference. No, you wouldn't. Because it's already happening. You've been reading it and ingesting it. And it's happening on a massive scale. And they don't have to get you or you or me. They just have to get enough of people to be convinced that this thing is true when it's not. So what do you do to, de to, to defend against that? Well, when you've got these, these uber-powerful models that are able to produce these social media-sized chunks of text, at will and, and at speed, uh, it becomes really tough, right? You can't just look at the words. It's not that simple. We're already falling for it. And we never had the manpower to deal with it in the first place. I'm going to go into some numeric techniques that have the potential to scale in a practical manner. And I'm going to show that in a, in a visual way using this particular tool. So what is this tool? We'll, we'll introduce that. And by the way, we talked about brain-computer interfaces. I was, I was going to do a 50-50 type thing. Do a, B, a, a BCI type of use case, show how things work, and then do a detection of chat GPT thing. But the problem was I wouldn't get a deep dive on either one. And everybody I've talked to so far has said, no, no, no. Do the chat GPT thing. So I'm going to breeze through the, P, the BCI stuff. If anybody wants a deep dive, if we have any neurosurgeons in the, uh, in the audience, if anybody here wants to do a BCI deep dive, I will be at the JavaFX BOF uh, later this after, uh, evening, uh, 6.50, I think? 6.50. It's over the BOF rooms. Okay. So all Trinity is is a vector-oriented visualization and extraction tool, which is good because what are machine learning models? Just gobs and gobs of vectors, right? 
It's not that simple, but it really is. Vectors in, visualization, dimension reduction, clustering, distance measurements, analysis. Doesn't replace the human, but makes them a hell of a lot faster and, and it lets them get a lot deeper into a model. Like, is my model well-trained? I just retrained my model. Is it doing better than before? Here's a glob of text. Was it generated by ChatGPT? This type of tool is very visual. And I will admit, you see that's a picture of me uh, without this. Uh, that's actually my son, he's 13. Uh, this is a family day, they let everybody <laughs> inside the lab. You know, it's just like, who cares about security? It's just let thousands of people in, who cares? And we've got these big glass walls in this big uh, uh, room that we manage, a visualization lab, and it's uh, touch glass, like, uh, like out of some damn sci-fi movie. And so a lot of the styles you're about to see, uh, we did so in such a way that it would be, it'd be visibly transparent through the glass and touch, you know, generate, you can move stuff around, that sort of thing. And JavaFX made it really easy to do that. Uh, so if anybody's interested in this sort of uh, technique, come see me afterwards. Or yell out the question, that's fine. So where did this tool come from? Now we're going to talk a little bit about brain-computer interfaces. So th this, this gentleman here, this participant, uh, was part of a U.S. Department-funded um, effort uh, to research how a person, a human being, participant could increase their capability with an additional sense provided by a bi-directional brain-computer interface. Blah, blah, blah. What does that mean? You got your eyes, you got touch, you can hear, right? You're, you got your five senses, right? But what if you had a sixth sense? Spare me the movie references. What if you had a sixth sense that you could receive and send information in some sort of lightweight encoded way? And what if you could use that at the same time as your regular senses? What could you do with it? Well, you know, up until now, up until recently, most brain computer interface uh, projects were focused on controlling things. Like, hey, I'm, I'm flying a plane with my brain, or I'm, I'm driving a car with my brain, or I'm typing with my brain, and those are important. This was novel. They were trying to have him, this participant, do higher level abstract request commands and controls. And so they, <laughs> so they asked me to create a custom sci-fi cyber defense visualization that actually doesn't do anything except respond to his, his commands. And it simulated this like attack from this like, these, uh, these cyber attacks from like, uh, you know, uh, fake countries, because if you do actual countries, like people get upset. And, and so he's, he's moving things around and he, on the screen, he's receiving things and he's, and he's responding both with his fingers and then actually multiplexing. It was incredible. But there was a problem. And this is where Trinity comes from. This is a whole different job effects visualization. We won't even talk about it. Every day, they had to retrain their decoding models. What does that mean? They had to have him come in. Now, he's quadriplegic. He has only partial functionality in one arm to move a mouse, right? So it's, it's a pain in the ass for him to even get into the, the hospital where they're doing the uh, research. But now they've got to have him lay down, and they, 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 they hook him up, and uh, they make him repeat the same actions over and over again. They're, they're training their models, and they had to do this every day for like an hour, hour and a half. So you got this guy, he's the only person in the whole world that has this thing jacked into his head. And you're wasting 20 to 25% of your time with him just retraining your model? But why were they doing that? Well, and this is where we're getting to the analysis part, I promise. If you look at these plots over here, uh, th this is one of the gestures, the neural gestures that this, this gentleman was asked to do. Uh, and it, you see some heat maps. These are the neurons firing, that sort of thing. Fine. And then you see uh, just a, two, uh, you know, uh, a week and a half later, two weeks later, it's different. He's doing the exact same thing as far as he's concerned, but it's actually qu the heat map uh, of the firing is quite different. And then again, a couple weeks after that. So by what they were finding was they would train their decoder model and it would work great. And then the next day, a little less, and then the next day, a little less than that. And by the end of the week, it just was garbage. It was unreliable, which is why they just said, okay, we're just going to train every day. But they couldn't figure out why. And so I read some papers, and I talked to some people that were smarter than me. 
And we realized that it was that they were using a linear decoding process, but this is nonlinear. A human being's brain is a biological neural network, and it's just like a neural network that you all know and love, you know, encode. It makes sense because one inspired the other, right? A human brain is nonlinear. So, okay, it's a vector problem. So what we did was we collected, uh, you know, the signals uh, coming off as big, huge uh, uh, BAVs, big ass vectors, right? And then we did a dimension reduction. In this case, we used um, a sort of like a pseudo, not a PCA, a Gaussian uh, process factor analysis thing. It's a there was a paper that said it was good. I don't know. I, ju I just, whatever the math guys say, I do. And the point is, it reduced the uh, 900 some odd uh, pins or neurons down to three dimensions. And then we plotted them. And this plot on the right, which was the earliest form of Trinity, was the result. Those, bl those red squiggles represented him doing nothing. And the blue signals represented him starting a, a neural gesture in his head reaching its climax and then coming back to rest, which is where the red is. And what we found was they are the same day to day, week to week. They're just rotated in subspace. Which meant that we weren't training on the whole shape. We were only training on slices of, of the shape, which happened to be whatever he, however he was that morning. Maybe he had too much coffee. Maybe he didn't get a good night's sleep. Right? Whatever. Okay. But then the money ran out. <coughs> no more BCI. Uh, and uh, I'm going to get to that. Uh, uh, but essentially, the AI guys were like, oh, we could use this for AI. And we have lots of money because everybody's using AI and nobody knows what the hell's going on. And I was like, yeah, money train. All right, let's do this. <laughs> it's true. It really is. <laughs> you know it. You're developers. You know where the money is. All right. So um, how, does, how does thinking work, right? This, these slides I made for the BCI part, but I left them in there, uh, even though we're going to go quickly to the large language model stuff, because it's the same thing that a generative AI does. It's just the generative AI has a statistical method, and of course it's encoded, or code, it's codified in code, right? So a human learns semantic value from its environment. Sees some coffee, goes through the eye into the brain, it's upside down. Uh, that I, I, you know, by the way, technically your brain sees things upside down. And then it kind of associates that image, in this case we're talking imagery, and the semantic value of it with these, these, these concepts, right? Okay, and then stores it. Sounds familiar, right? And then it can come back out and it's like, Coffee, yeah. So then later, on command, your brain, and this is one of the things that makes us very special as a higher order thinking uh, animal life form, you can pull from your brain and say it's this. I see this, or I want this, or I, I'm, I'm thinking of this. Even if you're presented with something that's not coffee. I'm, pre I'm presented with a cup of hot black liquid. I haven't smelled it yet, but I see the steam, I'm likely to think, hey, that's coffee, right? But what if you grew up on a desert island, right, where there's no coffee? Who knows what you would associate with? Because remember the previous slide, it hasn't been stored yet. You might hallucinate, right, like a generative AI model. I thought it'd be cute to leave these in. Oh yeah, arrows. And if you really are interested in this sort of uh, neuro type stuff, uh, the, this is actually the process by which the retrieval occurs, and each of these uh, uh, segments is approximately the time it takes from zero to make that happen. So it's not that, there, it's not that there's 600 milliseconds from the 455, that's 600 milliseconds from the start for this bottom one, the articulatory scores. Um, point being, though, is that humans can pull things up pretty quick, but not really quick com compared to a machine but we're very flexible, which is why we're so great at what we do, like giving presentations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, so, but let's get to something that's more interesting than brain-computer inter interfaces. That's not interesting, it's boring. 
Large language models, just words, lots of words. Let's talk about words. I'm going to show you a technique, and this is a research thing, and it's, there's gotchas, and I'm hoping that people will start firing out, um, hey, but what if, but what if, and why didn't you, and you're pretty stupid because you didn't think of, please fire that out, because that's, it's probably true. And I think this is a great opportunity to break those things down, okay? But I'm going to show you what's called a manifold approximation technique uh, combined with 3D volume techniques to provide quick indicators as to whether or not text has been generated by a large language model, okay? And again, there's some caveats. It's not 100%, a lot of variables involved, and we kind of, you know, just got this working a few weeks ago fully, so, but it, it does work. Okay, why are we doing this? Well, okay, remember I was talking earlier about all the bad people in the world? There's two. Oh, wait, there's a new guy. Yeah, yeah, okay, so these three. Yeah, and four. Um, they're going to use it against you, and they're going to keep using it against you, right? Uh, they've been using it against you, and me, and us. So um, it's too easy for, and I use the word adversary, for people who are bad actors to do really bad things, like spreading fake news, misinformation, and, and this is bad for society as a whole. So we can all go and we can clap and how great ChatGPT is, but the reality is it's being used in a terrible way. So whose fault is it? I don't know. You can't really stop them. So we need to find ways to make it less easy. To make matters worse, the recent upgrades of language models, especially ChatGPT 3.5 and up, make it so that they can very easily simulate with online communities. And we're going to focus on that specific subset of use cases, okay? What do I mean by social media and interaction like, like that? Well, <clears throat> the three, four sentences, you know, somebody ranting about this or, 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 you know, declaring that COVID vaccines have microchips in them, you know, and that they, they control your brain from space using lasers, you know, crap like that, that like millions of friggin' people believe And they won't be coming to this presentation, right? So we, why are they believing these things? It's because they've been using large language models to automate those interactions so it looks and feels like grandma on Facebook is interacting with some other grandma that agrees with her. But it's not. There's nobody there. And of course, the other problem is that these newer models, as you all know, have been trained on vast quantities of material, making them very good at what they do. So any solution that we put forth really needs to be, has to be practical, okay? Uh, it needs to, it's got to be designed to scale. What do I mean by that? Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, solutions kind of work or help in today, but what about when the, when the next model comes out, when a model improves, that sort of thing? Uh, then they, they don't work anymore, right? We, we need something that scales up. So it, it, the solution cannot focus on the output of the model itself as its sole method of solution. Meaning, if all you're doing is looking at the text, like the text that's produced by the model, it, 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 you, you can't. You can't win. I mean, there, there's little things you can do now, and it's only going to get worse as these models get better, right? I, think we, I mean, does anybody actually disagree with that? Everybody's on their phone, I think. Nobody's actually listening. I would have hoped somebody would have pushed back on that. Okay. And then finally, it, you, you kind of have to assume that you can't quite ever be 100%, right? And you can't, and I'm, I'll be the first to say that. So your solution needs to be an asymmetric one. What does that mean, asymmetric? It means if it costs the bad guys this many to do something bad, and all you have to do is spend this many to make it cost them this many, that's a win, right? It's not about stopping them. It's about making it so it's not cost effective because that's all these people care about. Cost, power, money, control. Sounds like an American corporation executive, right? Huh? I don't like them either. Okay, so how are we gonna do this? Huh? What's the solution? Oh, you can detect it. Show us the method. Okay, you got it. If you assume 
which is a safe assumption, and this is really broad stroking it here, that uh, your large language model is trained you know, by some sort of optimization function, uh, and you have access to the model, not, not visible internals, just black box, then you should be able to create a permutation of the text you're presented with. And once you've got a permutation, then you can compare the permutation to the original input and see how similar it is. But wait, you mean just rearrange it? No, 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 no. Here's an example. So this could be a, you know, any story, right? It could be a story about a dog or uh, you know, a dog that's lost its way or a kid that's going to school or some disgraceful politician. You know, you pick, you pick, right? And you, you have some text that's presented to you. You don't know if it's generated by ChatGPT. We'll just use ChatGPT like Xerox or Kleenex. So you say to yourself, well, I don't know if this is ChatGPT yet. So what I'm going to do is take ChatGPT and then I'm going to cherry pick select every other word, every third word, every fifth word, and that's a variable, right? That's one of the gotchas, okay? And then I'm going to take it out, mask it. And then I'm going to say, ChatGPT, fill in the blanks. Like a, like a Mad Lib, you know, remember? Uh, and then you do it again, and again, and again, a bunch of times. And then you get a bunch of variations. Now, I, I, uh, the slides are small. I, I, you, the number of variations matters, uh, and that's another gotcha, and that's part of the research we haven't gotten through yet, right? But the idea is that if you've got a, a cloud of variations, you now have what's called this, um, a, 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 a probability distribution, i.e., if you're comparing, if you're checking, if you have some sort of numeric method to see how likely is the input related to this ChatGPT-generated cloud of, of text, you can do those sorts of probabilistic comparisons. Remember I told you, I can't be 100% certain, but I can be pretty sure. So we combine this with a 3D volume uh, 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 manifold approximation technique that I'm gonna show you in a minute, uh, and it gives us pretty reliable results so far. Again, bunch of caveats, we'll get to that. Are there any questions so far? Okay, good. Thank God, okay. So why, does this, why did I start with this JavaFX application? What, what the hell? Well, okay, <clears throat> you can generate a bunch of text, right, and have gobs and gobs of text, and it's very difficult to search through that space manually, and you've got to write a lot of code to help you, and, and you can script your way through it. It's doable, but it's far easier to visualize it in 3D and then look for outliers, colorize it in different methods, be able to click on the damn thing. But if you're going to do it, it's got to run at scale, right? We can't, it can't be dozens or hundreds of instances. It's got to be thousands, tens of thousands to be, start to be useful. And that's one of the reasons why JavaFX was so important for this solution. Because it gave us the interactivity, it gave us the performance, it gave us, and it looks cool. Well, I think it looks cool. There's this one guy on Twitter that tells me it looks like crap. And I, I told him his mama looks like crap. And I'm okay with that, you know what I mean? I'm at DevOx and he's not. Well, I don't think so. Well, <laughs> that's interesting. I, sh I, should, I should, should have checked that out. Okay, so <laughs> once you have your data into a tool like Trinity, then what you can do is start to cluster it. And I'm going to actually demonstrate these things live. I'm keeping my eye on the clock here. Uh, and what you end up with are these really nice separations that can be colorized, and now you see clouds of ChatGPT generated text and clouds that are generated by a human. And if you rearrange your math, you can actually separate them from a hemispheric perspective. So tell me again why you can't detect whether or not text is generated by a, a large language model? Don't tell me I can't do something. I hate that. But you're not done. Because so what? You plotted some colors, right? Doesn't, doesn't actually mean anything. And yeah, an analyst could kind of look at it, maybe click around. The real solution is combining all of this similarity or the probability distribution approaches, combining it with what's called a manifold approximation. Uh, who here has heard of something called UMAP? Nobody. Okay, I, I, okay. 
Oh boy, what does it stand for? Uh, a Uniform Manifold Approximation Projection. It's published 2018, 2019. The AI guys, they love it. Uh, what it is is a fast, scalable, nonlinear dimension reduction and clustering algorithm. Very configurable. What you're doing is you're taking your ChatGPT vectors, uh, 1,536 wide, a BAV, right? And you've got a bunch of BAVs, right? A curtain of numbers. And what UMAP can do within seconds is using a combination of k-nearest neighbors and gradient descent type approaches, it figures out what things are most like each other and kind of separates them and gives you these nice clusters, right? The, the trade-off is a sacrifice of information. What you're doing is saying, instead of 1,536 dimensions of information, knock it down to three, okay? But if you're sacrificing information, you're losing a part of yourself. It'd be like me taking off my leather jacket. I'm not what I was, right? I'm still me, but it's a shadow of me. I don't like that person, right? So the question is, is that reduction of dimensions, i.e. the loss of information, is that information that's useful? For some problems, many problems, it is, or it is not useful, excuse me, meaning the reduction doesn't hurt your ability to do the analysis. And that's the bet that we make. And that's the trade-off that we have to make in order to make this human understandable. And this tool does it using JavaFX and, of course, JavaFX 3D. Once you do this projection, you've got this really neat thing. You've got three-dimensional volumes. These are what you would call manifolds, okay? Actually, technically, they're, appro they're, they're approxim approximations of sub-manifolds, meaning from a 1,500-dimension-wide hyperdimensional space, we have projected to a very specific 3D space. There are other 3D spaces in this multiverse. The configuration of our UMAP process gave us this specific one. And if we like that one because of the configuration, and we, we stick with that one, anything else coming into it will be in a sort of ordered state. And while it's not perfect, you start to get these nice groupings. And once you get the groupings, what you can do is take and measure the distance between an arbitrary point and another group. And that distance is another indicator from your probability distribution. Remember, we generated that point cloud. Each one of these points is a, is a point in that point cloud. Each one is a different variation of text. So you get that glob, right? You get that incoming piece of text, and you say, well, how far away is it from this one? Well, that far? Yeah, we're good. It's, it's not ChatGPT generated. Or if it is, it's, no, it's nothing like the one we're worried about, right? Why does that help? Well, how many people work on this stuff, right? There's not enough bodies in the world. But if you had a tool that could be run even headless, potentially, and just crank through these things, and then only red flag something that they see when it goes over a certain distance threshold and a certain similarity measurement, get some human eyes on it, now suddenly human interaction is feasible. And that's the whole point. Okay. So let's go to a live demo. We're just going to show what I just showed, right? Okay. Question. Uh, how do you determine uh, which you are going to use to reduce the vector? That's an excellent question. The question is, how do you determine the configuration of UMAP necessary to do the transformation? Right now, there are people, that's a great question, there, there are people who make whole, the whole careers on just knowing the configuration for something like UMAP. And I'm not going to lie to you, I actually am not that good at it myself. I just made a GUI with buttons. I was like, bang, 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 yeah, run, 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 run. And I just made it really fast. Um, trial and error. Now, you, now, there are certain things, there's aspects about the, conf the, the configuration that are, are pretty standard. Like when you, when you change the minimum distance or you change the repulsion strength, they tend to have this effect. And so I'm gonna, I am going to click around and show that stuff, actually. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But I w I'm not going to lie, there is some trial and error. And I would even, what do you find? Oh, these guys fly around and they find stuff. Some, they're, they're, yeah. I, 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 can't, I don't have time to explain wh what I do on weekends. Well, yes, question. Okay, um, 
I, you, the question was, can I explain uh, some of the features I'm using to uh, map to the text? Um, are you talking about the, the, like the JavaFX rendering uh, techniques, or are you talking about the large language model stuff? Okay, the large language model stuff. Um, well, okay, I'm, that part's not that complicated. It's just ChatGPT, and we're just, we're just saying, here is a chunk of text. We have a, well, I, I know, I'm one of the other guys on the team who's more of a data analyst. He, he wrote a little Python script that just chops out so many words, you know, and then, and then we just say, ChatGPT, please fill in the blank, and he wrote up a little prompt that did it. I'm not that great at prompt engineering, because it's not a thing, uh, but, uh, you know, we'll, we can argue about that later. Uh, but so I, I don't want to oversell that part, right? It's it, this was very exploratory over this summer. And by the way, we didn't invent the mask permutation thing. There, are, there were there was some academic literature that proposed it uh, and was published uh, earlier in the year. So what all we did was we just gave it a shot. And then when it started working, I was like, "Holy shit, I could plot this!" And I plotted. And I was like, "Oh shit, this this actually works!" And I just I was like, "This is consistent." And I was like, "Man, I can finally go to DevOx." Okay, first things first, let's load our data in into the tool. 19 minutes, an eternity. Okay, so let's get rid of that. So what does this data uh, look like, right? Bam. Of all the things, Notepad++ would fail. <laughs> of all the things. Oh wait, no, it's just in the background. Oh, it is, it is angry, okay. I, of all the things, I wouldn't have thought that a, a, note, a, a, a text editor would be the thing that foiled my, uh, <coughs> my uh, process here. All right, so what I wanted to do was show you the format of the data, but all, you, all you're going to see is 1,500 size vector and a glob of text, right? And there's a bunch of variations. That was pre-generated by some upstream scripts. I'm just going to drag and drop it into Trinity. It's going to load it. Awesome. And we're going to refresh that render. Okay, what do we got? This is a scatter plot. It's been colorized by the label of, for each text uh, blob. What is the label? The label is just a common label that was assigned for each mass permutation, meaning if we generated 50 mass permutations from this one input, they all have the same label. That way they can all be colorized the same. And you start to see a little separation here, right? These like galaxies of these clusters here, you know. But there is a lot of overlap, and might I remind you that we're just looking at dimension 0, 1, and 2. I can flip through them. I'm just going to, where's the keyboard? I'm going to just hit a key on the keyboard. I'm going to put focus on it. Hit a key. Are you kidding me? Oh, is that how you do me? Okay. Well, uh, I assure you, uh, it, there's, uh, there's more dimensions. And so then the question becomes like, well, okay, uh, why, why these dimensions? Why did you pick 0, 1, and 2? Why not 4, 5, and 6? Why not 1,500, right? And the answer is there is no good reason, right? There, th th this is not the way to visualize. For some machine learning, pro machine learning problems, it does make sense because they have their, their, their uh, BAVs are not so big ass, right? They're, they're more narrow. Or you have some other tools that give you an indicator as to what dimensions you should be looking at. The problem actually gets worse when you go and add the human versions. Okay, and we're not going to clear the data, let it plot all in the same space. It just gets more cluttered. Okay, not great, right? Okay, so reduce dimensions, right? Remember we talked about the, the UMAP approach, the manifold approximation approach? Good news, we have a projection tool built in the Trinity because this is the thing we have to do to, to be successful. Okay. We're going to fly that in, have a nice little retro wave thing going on there, very 80s. I spent more time than every other speaker spent on their presentations combined just to get that animation working. <laughs> and I, I can assure you I was not being paid to do it, and nobody in my life or my family was happy with me about it, having spent that much time. But I like it. I love it. And I can tell you do too. I see the smiles on your faces. Including the person that left just now. Yeah, there it is. Oh, just, I just, dude. Uh, oh, again. All right. Yeah. Right. I. I. Well, I, I can't. I gotta close it. And and then. Oh. 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 See, you didn't think they were gonna like it. The AV guys. He's like, I've seen some better presentations, but like, I can see. He's just like, oh. 
You won this time. Yeah. What were we talking about? Oh, yeah, we had a bunch of data that's over in the hyperspace. Let's get it down to three dimensions, right? So this, is, this addresses your question. What's your name, by the way? Duncan. Dun Duncan? Okay, D Duncan asked a really good question, and that's good. I like to give credit where credit's due. If anybody else has a question, please shout out. These are the settings he was worried about, okay? Stop fading out. Uh, what, what is your repulsion strength? What is your spread? How do you, how do you, how do you, what distance metric do you use? Uh, this is important, actually. The distance metric tends to have the most effect in terms of how you project than anything else. So who here did any math whatsoever? Not everybody raised their hand. Okay, that's why you became a software engineer, right? You <laughs> Technically, there's somebody else that's supposed to be the one that's good at the math. Euclidean is a straight line right? The Euclidean distance. So if you got two points, and there's all these other things that you can look at. Manhattan distance is like a chunk, 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 chunk. Sometimes they call it taxi cab. Uh, and then it, angular is like the rotational measurement between two points given a common origin. And, there, and then there's all these other like, ones that are more of a statistical distribution, like a, 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 a round robin type of comparison. They all slight, some are very similar, some are very different. And which measurement you, you select alters how UMAP tries to compare points and dimensions and to see which ones are similar and which ones are not. So I know through a lot of experience, and, you know, to get those screenshots back there, that uh, effectively I need something along these lines. Let's see. We're going to bump this up a little bit. Euclidean. And we're going to increase, so, so this is some of the experience that you gain. I know because I've got uh, all of my, san all my groups have at least 50 uh, common mass permutations that there, I, want, uh, it, I want it to be searching for up to 50 of the nearest neighbors. You know what I mean? Uh, the negative sample rate is how many times does it try to go uh, negatively sample to see if it's made a mistake, meaning shoot past, the, if it measures the distance, how far past does it go to keep checking to see if there's anything else out there. Uh, and so the more you increase this, the better, the, re the more precise the results are, but then it takes a lot longer because it's doing more work. Um, and then local connectivity is, is how much do you want to maintain that local structure? I mean, that's, uh, I might be wrong about that. You should all look it up. Ask ChatGPT. I'm sure it'll give you a great answer. But the point is, you know, there's a global structure versus a local structure, okay? And generally speaking, for these types of algorithms, you're going to trade one for the other. I don't care about the local structure so much. I care more about, in this case, a global structure, because I want to see where everything lives in their little clustered areas so I can see how far away they are. That distance doesn't matter in, in, you know, in terms of the real world. It's not a real number, but it matters for this particular projection. So now I'm going to run it. Just grip it and rip it. Pretty fucking fast, right? We just went through thousands of, of points in UMAP, and it, it, took, it took more time to, to change the, rate, the, the gradient on that thing than it did to run that thing. Because it's written in Java, open source, go get it on GitHub, and I parallelized the crap out of it. So everywhere there was a for, with a for loop within a for loop, I fixed that. Um, I, I kind of laugh, I see all these Python developers, and they're like, okay, well, we, we, got U, we're gonna, we ran UMAP on our data. And I'm like, okay, and? and? They're like, well, it's still running. <laughs> Good. <laughs> That's great. When I, after I retire, can you call me and let me know it's done be, you know, before the heat death of the universe? So here we have... <laughs> Why do you got to take a cheap shot at Python? Because it sucks. Okay, so okay, we, scr we scroll in. We've got all these like, nice colorized you know, clusters, right? And uh, <clears throat> it's kind of still a mess, right? So let's hide... Let's hide that. I know, I know. It, we've already had the laugh about how much effort I put into it. Whatever. Uh, we're going to want to just turn off and get rid of the... Oh, inner walls. Yeah, I'm an idiot. Okay. Maybe do that. Okay, great. So now we just see just our clusters, right? Uh, what I did was I removed the 2D projections, right? If, 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 this, is a, if this is a projection of data in 3D space, right? and you get rid of one of the dimensions, that's what it looks like. And sometimes separation is easier to see in two dimensions versus two other dimensions versus two other dimensions. 
So we're looking at this and we're saying to ourselves, uh, okay, we've got it. There's a lot of, it appears good separ separation, but then like, you know, what, uh, what are these, right? So as the kids would say, I got you fam. Uh, so I got a little configuration here, which uh, Trinity accepts just JSON. It'll colorize everything that was generated by a human and everything that was generated by ChatGPT. And then it will also colorize differently from those the original text message. Remember, we're taking text blobs and we're, we're variating them, we're, we're permu per permuting them, okay? So we need to see which ones were the original. And lo and behold, red, wait, is red bad? Yes, ChatGPT. The red ones, red is bad, ooh, except in Canada where it's the good thing. And then, you know, so everything that's red up there was generated by ChatGPT, and everything that is blue was generated by a human. That separates pretty damn good, right? For this extremely narrow use case, for this extremely controlled, like, research experimental setup, right? But wait, <clears throat> you got some problems over here. It's not perfect, right? It's never gonna be perfect. I'm not perfect. Most of you are pretty close, I can tell. You're very beautiful people. I'm glad you came. Please come to the JavaFX best of friends thing after this. So this is where the distance stuff comes in. So we bring up our animated. Uh, by the way, you can get this. This is part of uh, LitFX, it's open source library. Carl Dia made most of this and he's just amazing. Uh, what we need to do is figure out this particular manifold and figure out the distance. So the, again, we got you, I got you fam. I think that's how it's pronounced. So whoop, let's figure out what are these as an AI. Mm, okay, awesome. So these are all the labels it auto discovered. Many are here, but there's that one. Generate ye old manifold. Mm. What just happened? Some math, you know. Uh, what just happened is we calculated a convex hull. Anybody know what a convex hull is? One guy. Oh, two. Like, oh, everyone's like, I know, I know, uh, yeah. Just don't ask me. A convex hull is just, you get a bunch, a cluster of points, and it is the outer shape of those points, but the most, but the most efficient uh, arrangement of that. And uh, there's, there's different um, algorithms, and this one uses a, a variation of the quick hull algorithm. Uh, but essentially what you get is, that, that sort of thing. Now let's reduce this point size a little bit. Yeah, okay, awesome. So what? Well, the so what? Now you've got, that, you've got that probability distribution stuff, you've got this point cloud, and now you've got a volume in manifold space, an approximation. Anything inside that volume, it's pretty safe to say that's, that's generated by ChatGPT, right? And so if you were to maybe, you know, click on this, I'm gonna minimize that. I'm gonna hold, I'm just holding down control. We just got this working. Oh man. Oh, no, no, no. that's so good. And then you, <laughs> and then you just randomly click on this thing over here. It says, yay. That is 56 units, whatever that is, away. And then you can kind of dig in here, you know? And most importantly, using these, these, the 3D volume in this, in this, this sort of, this, literally this JavaFX triangle mesh, now you can, you can make easy determinations. Is the point that I clicked on inside the bounds, which is essentially the volume d uh, displacement box, is, and by the way, JavaFX computes that for you. That was easy. Is it inside the hull? Eh, that, that took a little more effort. Um, that was a custom math thing. Is it on the hull boundary? That was pretty easy too. I just took the the, the, the mesh view and did some quick calculations based on the faces. Uh, faces are the, the triangles that make a 3D shape. So now I can look at this and I can say, mm, well, it was awfully damn close. But then I might look at this and I might say, but that one is like an, kind of the farthest point away from the mass. I may want to remove that, you know what I mean? So you can then customize your, your, project, your, um, your, your manifold if you're like a subject matter expert, let's say. Let's see here, um, right click. I almost forgot. You can edit the, the geometry on the fly. So you wanna get rid of that point? Turn off the fade out. See how I'm 
every time I hover over it, it switches things, something in the list. Bam. Just rerun, rerun. It's rerunning the quick hole algorithm every time in 3D. Think about that for a second. Imagine doing all this in a web page. Imagine getting hit by a bus at 50-50. You know, I would love, I, I don't know which one I'd like more. But the point is now, these tooling like this, you take these, these sorts of numerical methods that are practical. You give them to an analyst with subject matter expertise who could then jump in with, with derivative tools like what I'm showing you here and make small tweaks. And now you've got something that you can flow from a human being that can keep pace with powerful language models like ChatGPT, et cetera. Okay? Okay. I know you guys are all thrilled. So let's go to like our last slide, which is just like what just happened. A second to last. Okay. <clears throat> I'm not in presentation mode. Let go. Now, class, where are all the ways that this went wrong? Right? I went through a very, very precise, curated workflow. You must have seen something that you were like, wait a minute, you didn't do blah, or you, you, why didn't you do blah, blah, blah. He identified it, he gets an A. He's, he's blowing the curve up for you all. You better, you, somebody else better come up with something. I listed some. I'm not gonna read it to you. You can read, right? Does anybody have any ideas? I got a, I got a hand over here. Mm. Well, so the, the probability part, so the question is, now that you've got this, this cloud of ChatGPT variants, how do you get from there to the probability? You walk down the hall to the math guy and you say, give me your script that calculates a probability distribution. And I know, that is what I do. But there, there are, um, I don't have the content to show you, but essentially there are some classical statistical methods which essentially calculate a similarity index, things like jacquard measurements. Um, uh, there's, a, there's something called a ZAMPF uh, measurement, which is a frequency-oriented measurement. These things are operating at the word level, and those give you probability values as to how, how likely this thing is related to this distribution, distribution being the point cloud. The 3D thing that I showed you is more of a, a raw distance measurement. That's more of a, a classic Euclidean approach. The probability distribution stuff and the distance thing are two separate but interconnected things. So they're, they're essentially, what I'm saying is there are two indicators that you put together, like a committee of machines. It's a committee of statistical methods. If one votes high and the other votes low, maybe you can ignore it, but if both vote high, meaning, this, this distance metric measurement is too close, and this, this similarity measurement of whatever numerical method you use is the probability is too high. Yo, get somebody in here, right? So I hope that answered your question. There. there. So if you have to run, uh, do 10 permutations per request, aren't you spending 10 times more than the bad guys? And then if you have to do the multiple NLMs, aren't you spending 100 times more? So he asked a question that completely torpedoed everything I just said. It, and I, I think I gotta work on my resume now. Um, the question is, like, if you're running all these permutations and then um, it, uh, you have to spend money on each token, then uh, isn't that inherently anti-asymmetric? It's the exact opposite. The research was to find the method, not the cost factor. And let's just say our organization has access to resources that are internal, that we don't have to pay a damn thing. Well, we pay out the ass in the hardware, but like, you know. So, so it, it kind of works for us. <clears throat> now you say that, um, you could argue that uh, you could take a, a quantized version of ChatGPT, run it internally, and then now you don't have to pay anything, right? Or there's some sort of upfront license fee. That's an excellent point. And that's why I don't want to claim victory quite yet. I got one minute left. Any more questions? Question here. It is. This is on GitHub right here. These are, these are screenshots from GitHub. Well, we haven't got that far in the research. I love this question. He's basically saying 
there's a counter AI arms race, race, and every time a good guy comes up with something that that help that def that defeats the bad guy, you're informing the the bad guy on how to do better. And in those arms races, the bad guy always wins. The good guy always loses because the bad guy's not going to stop. So he's asking, doesn't this just inform the bad guys? Well, and and I think you meant from a numerical perspective because you mentioned optimization. Yeah. I mean, like yeah. Well, the, our hypothesis, and we have not been able to test this yet because it just takes time, is that the more your model, your large language model scales up and improves, the more precise it is, which is going to cause those point clouds to get smaller and smaller. But that might not work. I don't know. Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the current bleeding edge of the research, okay? Oh. Yes, you would, but then, but then, but then the th see. That's what I'm saying. I, we we haven't gotten that far yet, and and we're, yeah. I mean, could, he's saying they could use this this method that I proposed to spank my own ass with it and be like, yeah, we got you, son. Like, and then I maybe, I've been I've been had many times, but uh, I think I m the hope is, and I say hope, I, the hypothesis is that. If we then just rerun this, it changes the numbers again. I mean, because remember, w w this process and this approach doesn't care how you train your, your model. All it cares is that your model is consistent after the training. So essentially, if, even if we did, um, I'm hoping that even if we use the, this method to optimize the model further, really all, all you're doing, it's not that you're, you're moving the, the, the bar, it's, or it's not that you're lifting the bar higher to, to exceed, you're shifting everything up. Like an elevator. That's a terrible analogy. Can somebody help me here? No. Of course you can. You don't want to. I deserve this um, as I die up here alone. Okay. Uh, we can talk more later. I'm, I'm out of time. It says time's up zero minutes. So uh, there's another question. Yes, yeah, great. Well, they're going to kick me out. Thank you very much. So yeah. We were talking about text, but is this working about images or videos? Because it would be maybe bigger. Answers. And I don't know if you have the proper power for that. Um, all I can say is we have begun research this week on applying this to deep fake audio. And I can't say anything more than that. Mostly because we just started the research. But, but like, I'm, I, I don't feel comfortable saying it to a recording in front of a bunch of national, foreign nationals because that, that's where I lose my job. So, you know. <laughs> These things were, were mostly approved already to go out the door, right? So I can, I can say it out loud. Uh, but yeah, yeah. You know what? That's a fantastic ob observation. Th what's your name? Peter. Peter. And what was your name? Where? Where? This one. Jasper. Jasper. Peter. Jasper. Duncan. Thank you for making my presentation just like a hair better. Um, this tooling and this approach doesn't care about text. It doesn't even know what text is. All it knows are vectors. We have to start thinking in hyperdimensionality. We have to start thinking in, in, as humans in vectors. And, and yeah, the, the software's starting to hit the streets in, 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 for, in terms of open source, but we have to get beyond our three-dimensional world. Just like no problem's black and white, there's many, many facets to every problem, many, many colors. All, these are, this is the way we have to think in the future. Screw it, one more question. Yes. And then you can uh, relate uh, text to that fingerprint. Yes. Now, I know you said front engineering was real. My subjective experience... <laughs> <laughs> He's like, so I put prompt engi engineer on my resume, so let me argue for a minute. <laughs> my subjective experience uh, is that the way you phrase your prompt heavily influences the style and tone of the output of chat. Oh, excellent point. You're totally right mostly because I want to kind of like subtly apologize for being so mean to prompt engineering. Yes, there's prompt engineering. You, he, what he's saying is, well, how did you write your prompts to request ChatGPT to fill in the blanks? Because that friggin' matters, right? Nobody else asked that question. Um, I bet you're all thinking it, though, right? You're all, oh, yeah, you didn't think it, but this guy, he knew. What was your name? Daniel. Daniel. Nice, man, nice. 
By the way, there's a raffle starting here in like a couple more minutes. So I, I, the fact that everybody isn't like barreling out of here to get to the raffle, I really appreciate it. Any more questions? All right. Thanks a lot.